be showing us a little map for those of us who don't know quite how remote she is up there later. Um, and thanks also to Julie, who is um, from Hill Care Homes and having a very busy time at the moment. So thank you so much for sparing the time. Um, and she will be talking to us about how they have been using um, technology and some of these devices to help people stay connected. So I'll just move on um, from there. And as I say, Chris is, is keeping an eye on any questions that are coming through. So just some brief uh, housekeeping. As I've said, you should see live captions appearing uh, at the bottom of the screen there, and they'll um, come up throughout the webinar. Um, we ask that people please use the Q&A window um, to ask questions and not the chat window. Um, we've disabled that for a couple of reasons. The main one being that um, anyone who's using a screen reader, what we've discovered from colleagues is that it actually reads out everything that goes in there. So it can be quite distracting for people who are using a screen reader and it just makes it a bit easier for us to, to manage that as well. Um, there'll be a chance um, to ask questions, but if you do have any um, now, please do start popping them in there. And as I say, my colleague Chris um, is keeping an eye on those um, and will let me know when the time comes. Um, everybody who has registered for the webinar will get slides, a transcript and a recording, and that will all be made available after the webinar and you'll be notified via email. Um, and there will also be a feedback form where we ask follow up questions and a survey so that you can tell us how you found it and also any improvements that you'd like us to make in the future. So please do take some time to do that if you if you can. So just briefly, um, I'm going to talk a tiny bit about AbilityNet um, and how we help older and disabled people. Um, we'll meet the panellists in some more detail. Um, we'll be kicking off and looking at Grandpad, um, which is a tablet for seniors. Comp, a device that AbilityNet has been working very closely with around connecting people in the community. And we'll be hearing a bit more about the device itself, but also um, a real world application from Sue. Um, and then we'll be um, hearing from how a care home setting has actually been using um, technology to keep people in touch. And I think, you know, that's been a real theme, which I've noticed during the pandemic is the use of technology to help people who are isolated for a number of reasons, but definitely that um, connection into care homes and also healthcare settings actually. I'd heard from one of our volunteers yesterday how they have been helping uh, um, NHS setting um, use tablets and adapt them for people who are on the COVID ward who've got a hearing impairment. So that's just one example of what we, we do with AbilityNet is provide that kind of support. So just to say a little bit more about us, um, we are a charity. Um, our, our driver is that we believe in a digital world accessible to all at home, which is primarily what we'll be talking about today at work and in education. We have over 300 um, volunteers. As I said, for obvious reasons, they're not providing face to face support at the moment, but we are supporting people by phone and remotely using uh, remote software. Um, the helpline number is there um, and they'll answer your question as well if they can, or they'll signpost you to one of our volunteers for something more in depth. Um, we also offer a lot of online support. So My Computer My Way is a database of adjustments that you can make to a variety of devices, phone, tablets, laptops, covers all operating systems and platforms. So you'll find Chromebook on there, um, iOS, all kinds of different um, resources on there. My Study My Way is a fantastic resource for students. Um, there are free fact sheets on a variety of topics. So one of the really popular ones is alternative input and keyboard devices. Um, look out for future webinars on that homepage there. And again, that's where you'll find uh, details from today. Um, and we can also help students with disabled student assessment, which actually when students are working remotely, that's been a really valuable resource for people as well. So I'm just going to um, launch a poll because um, I want to start hearing um, from the people that we have got with us today. So I'm going to launch the poll now. 
Um, and it's just um, a simple yes or no. So the question is, do you currently own a tablet? So um, if you'd like to just pop your answer there, um, and I can see the percentage of people who are voting. So I will just wait until that number levels off um, and give people an opportunity to respond there. Just interesting to see if people already own a device um, and we'll be finding out some more about um, about you later on as well. We've got a couple more polls coming up, so. So we're at 89%, just see if it, any more for any more. Looks like uh, most people have voted now. So I will just end the poll and you should uh, see some results on screen. So hopefully everyone can see um, the results being shared there. So in terms of, looks like a majority of people do own a laptop. So 76%, a tablet, sorry, 76% already own one and the nose um, 24%. So yeah, just an in, given that's what we're gonna be talking about today, just interesting to see who already owns a device. So I'll just stop there and move on. So Grandpad, um, over to you guys. Um, if you'd just like to pop yourself off mute um, and uh, we're doing the um, coronavirus next slide, please. So just please do, let me know um, when you want me to move on. So welcome, Jeff. Yes, thanks for having us. Uh, delighted to be part of this, uh, as 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 always. Um, so I'm Jeff Rochford. I'm on the platform and operate team uh, with Grandpad Europe. Um, we're our European office is based here in Ireland, but we uh, have a our largest user base in in uh, Europe would be in the UK. So. Uh, delighted to be here to talk to you a little bit about, uh, introduce what Grandpad is and, and talk about what we're all about. So if you want to move to the next slide. So everything that we do in Grandpad is based around uh, our mission and our vision. Um, and our mission being improve the lives of millions of seniors by re reconnecting them with their families, friends and caregivers. And our vision is to live in a world where no seniors are lonely or isolated and every senior has the opportunity to live grand. Um, so th those are what we, we strive with everything that we do with our Grandpad tablet. Uh, in fact, we actually, we just had a, mi uh, a milestone uh, on New Year's Day actually, where we actually had a million active users. Um, now that's, that's users across uh, people with the tablet, but also their companions and their, their, their network. So um, the next step is, is millions of seniors, but we've got at least a million um, connecting a million lives at the moment. So we were we were very happy with that up to fall on New Year's Day this year as well. So um, yeah, if you want to go ahead to the next slide. So why was Grandpad conceived? What is uh, what is the point of Grandpad? Why does it exist? Um, it, it's really it was originally envisioned to uh, address one major problem. Um, and that is that um, older people or older adults age 75 plus or more disconnected or isolated um, than they ever have been. Um, this, uh, this was the, the idea for Grandpad was what it came out of uh, our founders, uh, Scott and Isaac, um, contacting their, uh, well, Isaac's grandmother, Scott's mother uh, across the country in, in the US and trying to use or uh, coordinate Skype, a uh, Skype call. Um, this was over six years ago now. Um, and how difficult that was and just how unsatisfactory it was to get going on both sides. And if anybody's ever used Skype, you probably uh, know how difficult that is yourself anyway. Um, but they, you know, they, they thought there had to be a, a better way. And the more research they did, the more they discovered how important something like making technology, making the ability to make a, a video call as easy as possible and how, how important that can be um, to bring people together and fight isolation. Um, nothing is as good as in-person contact, but when it's not possible, and we know that um, over the last year and on and beyond, um, we know that at least engaging through technology, giving uh, people a window to connect to their loved ones and their caregivers um, can, can make a huge difference. 
Um, so that's the problem that we sought uh, to address. Um, the solution uh, became a tablet. Um, and that went through a lot of different iterations, a lot of testing. Uh, the idea of a phone was thrown around, um, but we they landed we landed on a tablet, the form factor, and specifically an eight inch tablet because uh, it was uh, um, an accessible size to hold in your hand, to move around freely for the older person that we were targeting the device for. Um, so there was three. Um, elements to creating GramPad, and that was the hardware, the software, and the service that would back it up. Um, we designed the, uh, the, as I said, the hardware specifically with our hardware manufacturer partner, Acer. It's a custom built tablet. Um, it has uh, specific features in it, like a um, uh, touch sensitive screen, um, which is much more sensitive to, to uh, drier touch because um, as you get older, the, uh, your, your um, skin gets drier and it doesn't uh, react as well to standard passive screens um, as well as you'd like. And we, we, you know, that was taken into account. Um, this was all done through feedback and research um, through uh, our grand advisor uh, team, which I'll get into in a little bit, but this was all vetted by, um, by people out, out there who uh, would be using this technology. Um, the, uh, the software then obviously had to be, um, accessible. It had to be, um, uh, uh, geared towards the people that we were, uh, aiming the technology for. It had to, uh, appeal to them and be engaging to them. Um, and, uh, something that, uh, an older person would pick up and start using right away because those first few minutes of engagement with a piece of technology for any demographic are extremely important. If you're not engaging with, with software within the first sort of 30 seconds to 60 seconds, um, it, it, you might never engage with it again. So it had to be um, very much uh, accessible right off the bat. Um, and as, like I said, it started off with video calling, but as, as we grew and we recognized uh, what other applications could be uh, put on there and how that can help to combat isolation, more things were added, um, such as uh, specific articles, uh, making it, uh, news easily accessible, um, a safe and secure web browser, safe and secure email, and so on and so forth. And that grew out of, again, more research and feedback. One of the most important things then um, about the entire GramPad system is the service that, that backs it up. Um, so it is a tablet. It's, it's designed for the older person to be engaging. Um, we, we covered the hardware and the software, but there's an element um, that's missing to a lot of technology, and that's, that's the, um, the human behind it. Um, so the main, one of the main features of GramPad is that uh, the last button on every single GramPad uh, is a health button. And if, you, if the user, the older person taps that, they will get through to an actual person um, on the other end um, right away. Um, there's no waiting. Um, and that, that's always there. That's 24 seven, 365 days uh, a week, we or a year. We have uh, the team here uh, based in Ireland. We have the team in the US and we provide 24 seven coverage. And that button can be used for anything, um, any questions about the tablet, uh, adding or removing features, but it's also there for any reason. So if anybody uh, just wants to have a chat, they can tap that help button. They'll get through to one of our, our, our uh, member experience agents um who, who are more than happy to to do that so that's that's the whole ecosystem um uh the the other element of it uh was uh the one of our obviously the main concerns is, is making sure that the it, it stays a safe environment um we all know that through um when you're when you put yourself on the internet and you go through into a social network or or any element um, you uh, are opening yourself up uh, to uh, the internet, basically, and that it can be a wonderful thing, but it can also be um, a, a bad thing. 
Um, so one of the concepts that was really important is making sure that we had a secure family network. It's a secure uh, social network for uh, putting the older person at the center of that. So with the ground pad, um, the, uh, the family can create a secure social network that will only include approved contacts, um, whether they be family, friends, or caregivers. And it's only those people within that trusted family network that are able to communicate with the ground pad, uh, share photos, um, send emails, call them. Um, all of that kind of thing. So that while you're still, uh, the, the older person is still connected uh, to the people that matter most to them, they're still in a safe and secure environment where they're not being exposed to uh, the bad actors that are out there um, using technology for other than, than what we are. Fantastic. That's a real whistle stop um, tour. And as you were talking, I know there's a, a lot of synergy with um, some of the design principles from Comp and um, some of that trusted user thing as well. So I'm really keen to, to hear from them soon. But first, we have um, another poll um, to hear from the people that we've got here. So I will just launch our second poll now. Um, so if I launch this, hopefully you can see it on screen. So I will read out um, the question. So it says, what technology tools have you used to stay in touch with older relatives while they have been distanced from you? And you can tick as many as apply. So the first one is a chat app, um, e.g. WhatsApp, um, email, um, might be keeping in touch with people via email, old fashioned phone call, which I think we often forget about these days, um, video conferencing, e.g. FaceTime, Zoom, um, other, um, and if you if you just select other and you'd like to leave a message in the box um, with some more information in our Q&A box, then please do. Um, so yeah, so how are you keeping in touch with people via a chat app, via email, phone call, video conferencing, um, or some other way that um, I hadn't thought of there. Could be social media, I guess, actually. Might be social media. So as before, I just uh, wait for, um, just give it a few seconds just so that everyone has an opportunity to um, take as many boxes as apply. Um, I know I'm doing the majority of those. Just give it a tiny bit longer. So a couple more people putting some options in. Right. So the numbers are stabilized now. So I'll just um, end the poll and share the results before. As before, so here we go, share those results. So by far and away, actually, the most popular option is um, phone call with 93% uh, of people saying they're doing that. Looks a little bit neck and neck between um, chat and video conferencing. So 67% for video, 62% chat, uh, email 51% and then other 13%. So I'll be interested to um, have a look at any comments um, afterwards and, and just curious to see what people have put in there. So I'll stop sharing now. And we'll move on. So comp, over to you, George, welcome. Um, yeah, so tell us all about comp, which I know AbilityNet's been working very closely, but I'm sure there's lots of people who um, are keen to hear more about the platform. Great, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, very pleased to be here to tell you about our organization and comp. Um, if you can just skip to the next slide. So um, yeah, No Isolation is the name of our organization and we were founded in Norway in 2015. And um, we build what we call warm technology um, to bring people together. So we kind of coined this phrase um, as technology that's very specifically designed for a particular user group. Um, and with us, we're, our mission is to um, end loneliness and voluntary social isolation through the development of, of such technology. Um, I think for context, I'll just quickly mention our first product, which is AV1, which is actually a small telepresence robot, um, which was designed for children with a long-term illness. So um, it's about uh, this big, uh, about 30 centimeters tall, 
I mean, it sits on the desk in the classroom of a child who might be at home or in hospital, meaning they can take part of their lessons and stay in touch with their friends. Um, so that was our first product, but we then moved on to trying to help um, people at the other end of the age spectrum. And that led to us to develop COMP. So if you can skip to the next slide, please. So COMP um, is um, just very simple one button screen, but I think I just want to talk about how we got to this point. Um, we, very, we have a phrase where we say, um, throw away the idea and focus on the problem. So we see a lot these days, um, some existing technologies being adapted to try and suit people's needs, but we've really tried to strip it right back. Um, so we actually went to a care home uh, and met with um, the uh, residents there about different, uh, and talked to them about what would be um, the best piece of kit for them. And they wanted um, you know, a very familiar design. So you'll notice it looks a bit like an old style television or radio. Um, and it's a large screen, it's about 17 inches across um, with just one button. And we actually, our first prototype user was quite reluctant to have it in his home um, and asked it to be put at the end of his kitchen out the way. Um, but within a couple of weeks, he'd. Uh, called us and asked us to move it into his living room by his coffee table. So, um, yeah, I think as we often see, there's some initial reluctance, but the simplicity of comp makes it um, accessible to all. Um, a few other bits of research that went into this, you've actually um, seen that, um, particularly over the age of 80, sometimes people's fingertips can become dry and leathery, which can mean that touch screens won't actually work. Um, so we've removed the touchscreen element and it actually just has one on and off button, which um, uh, yeah, controls the volume as well. And how it works is the comp would be sat in the home of, of the um, person and their family or friends are connected to it via an app on their phone or tablet. And they can um, send photos, messages and make video calls all without the need for any complex passwords um, or uh, anything else. It just receives that content to the device. So for us, it is very much about connecting the family up to their loved one who may not have been able to connect through other means, such as the ones that were just on that poll, for example. Um, if you skip to the next slide. So since then, we've also developed Comp Pro. Now this is like an add an add on piece of software, um, which can be used by care providers um, in care homes. We have charities, domiciliary care agencies, or local authorities using this. And this is a separate piece of software which can do much the same as um, the family uh, app, but uh, can also send reminders um, for medication or. Uh, schedule events which might be visits from carers or video calls um, and this also gives a way of an organization managing multiple devices if they have those within a care home or as part of their um, domiciliary care for example. Importantly it's a private uh, network between the family and the carers so the family won't see what the care ag agency is sending and vice versa. Um, but it will all be received to the same single device. So there's no change needed for um, the comp user. Importantly, I should say as well, the, the comp comes with um, a 4G SIM. So it's all it needs doing is plugging in and then it's online, providing there's a 4G network there. Um, if you just skip to the next slide, there's a bit more of a diagram. Um, sorry if it's hard to see here, but it just shows how the single comp um, can be connected to with the network. So we've got family members connected via the app, sending them messages and content, um, but also they might be connected up to their um, a nurse or um, a physiotherapist that might video call them for um, physiotherapy sessions. So um, yeah, Compro adds an extra element of um, options there of how care can be provided remotely. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a whistle stop into Comp and Comp Pro. And yeah, happy to ask, answer any questions later on when the time comes. 
That's fantastic. Thank you ever so much for that. Um, and before we just go into um, hearing from Sue and about some real world applications of comp, just wanted to take a, a little bit of time to reflect on both of those and we'll come back to questions after. But what I think I really love about both applications, both devices, is that they share that element of co-design of actually, you know, you've both talked about the leathery fingers and the fact that you've both del delivered solutions for that particular demographic. There's a lot of thought and care that's gone into it. Also that um, trusted platform um, and thinking about keeping a safe environment and um, for people to be able to connect, um, which brings me nicely to you, Sue, and it actually says that there, supporting people to live safely independently and well at home. So um, here is the aforementioned map. So I'll pass over to you to explain where you are and, and a little bit about what you've been doing. Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Sue Long and I am the implementation lead for Empower in the Western Isles. And um, this is a European funded project. Um, and as you can see here, to support people to live safely, independently and well at home. And just to put in some context of um, how rural and remote we are, um, we're a string of islands off the northwest coast of Scotland, um, about 40 miles away from the mainland. And our service covers from the top of Lewis to the southern uh, tip of Barra in this, the southern isles. Um, we invited along today to look at some of the work that we've been doing around making people more uh, digitally included. Um, and Sarah, if you could move to the next slide, please. Okay, so as I say, this is a, a programme that's funded uh, through Europe. Um, we are one of three uh, teams in Scotland. So there's ourselves in the Western Isles, Dumfries and Galloway, and Ayrshire and Arran. Um, the programme supports anyone who is 65 or over living with a long term condition. And it's about empowering them to have more control over how that condition is managed and how they can take um, start to be less perhaps socially excluded than they are at the moment. Uh, the project, as I say, supports anyone who's 65 or over, but in the Western Isles, we support anyone who is 18 or over living with a long term condition. And how we start that process is to work with individuals. We do a well-being plan because this is very much about the person. It's not what we think, it's about what the person feels and what the person thinks. So a well-being plan would focus on three key areas. One would be their health. What are the things that impact their life through their health? Um, their likes and interests. So what are the things that they really enjoy doing? And finally, digital. So do they have access to a tablet? Do they have access to a mobile phone? And do they actually use it? We find in the Western Isles that um, we do have an older population. A lot of people move away. I can talk from my own experience. I've lived off the islands for a number of years. We purchased my mum an iPad and left it with her and said, stay in touch. And um, that never happened. But every time we returned home for a trip, it was, how do I do this? How do I do that? So we're very keen with uh, Empower and when we work with our service users is to find out what they do have and how they use them and how we can help uh, to move that forward. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. And I can probably split this into pre-COVID and during COVID. So before COVID, we would find that for a lot of people uh, in keeping in touch, it would be showing someone perhaps how to send an email or it would be showing someone how to do online shopping to secure that they had uh, a mixed diet available to them at home. Um, transport is, an, is a problem here. Uh, it's not regular. Um, and again, remote communities aren't always best served, but we do have Tesco network that delivers to all areas, but those slots are precious. So quite a lot of um, support was around how to access slots for Tesco's and how to make sure, as I say, they had access to, to food. Um, we also started uh, working with AbilityNet. Um, I've been linking in with Chris now for two and a half years because we within uh, Empower have a limit, a finite 
relationship with somebody. As I say, it's about building up their skills and empowering them. And um, so we've left people, a lot of people with AbilityNet's contact details um, to then support them to move on in their journey. Uh, next slide, please, sir. Okay, this is more what we've been doing since COVID um, and brings to the point of, of comp. Um, we've always worked with people uh, around digital to find out what matters to them. So we've um, had access to some devices. So we've, we've done a try before you buy. Um, and with those devices, we've always, uh, as J Jeff and George have also said, it's about what matters to that person. So what are the things that might draw them in and engage them with a the device? So we started off with um, some Samsung tablets that we had. Through ongoing conversations, we then found uh, that people might like doing quizzes. So we've, we've lent out some Alexas and um, people have smartphones. So what are the key things that they might want to do with a smartphone? And um, we've also worked or try applied through Connecting Scotland for devices to support our service users throughout this time. Um, and also become aware of the comp because it's key around here that uh, no, it's not one size fits all. So people have different abilities, they have different levels of understanding, um, and it's about finding out what will best serve that person. So I was made aware of the comp um, over a year ago by someone who had bought the device for their own mother. And uh, as the Western Isles became more digitized, felt that this may be a good tool to support some of our service users who would not be able to link into an iPad or a, a laptop. So we purchased um, four devices and we were allocated one by AbilityNet. Um, our devices are distributed across the Western Isles with a high degree of success. Um, so for example, we have one lady who she just couldn't use her iPad or her phone because she wasn't able to see. She had uh, sight issues. Um, so doing video was not uh, a thing for her. So she was missing out on family in Glasgow, for example. So we lent her a comp and just the size of the screen is, as George has described, the fact that she only has to turn the device on and that her family then connect into her. So it's made a real difference that she's been able to see family in Glasgow, that she can have a few family connected, that she can have a conversation with people, that she's able to see pictures that are sent. Um, and she really doesn't have to do anything other than switch the device on. You'll have to excuse the uh, fire alarm on a Tuesday lunchtime. <laughs> Okay, and it may go off again in a second, so my apologies for that. Um, so that, that's one example um, with the comp. We've also had uh, additional success in one of the Southern Islands in, US, in the US. And again, we, we use these devices, a pause. Okay, so we use these devices again on a try before you buy. So we um, were working with a, a project. They had some iPads and they found that when they were through COVID and the delay in being able to work with people, that a number of people for the iPad, they weren't then able to use it. So we talk, told them about the comp um, and they tried the comp and uh, they've now ordered six um, through a charity and are ordering six of their own. And there's a lady whose father we lent it to who was able to share in his sister's birthday in Glasgow, see, him up, see her opening her presents, the candle on the cake, things that he'd not been able to do previously. And she's now set up a crowdfund and is crowdfunding for comps for, uh, for a US for her father and for others to be supported through it. 
That's brilliant. Thanks, Sue. Sorry to just. That's fine. No. I'm mindful of our time and I can yeah. see lots of questions piling up as well. Um, but I think just following on from the writers that have been specifically designed with people in mind, it's so lovely to hear some real world examples of where, where that's really working. So um, I think we've covered most of these questions. This was a crib sheet for us just to make yeah. sure that we covered everything off. Um, so um, I'll move on now to yourself, Julie. And I know um, specifically during these challenging times of COVID that um, you guys, oh, I've got a poll before you. Sorry, I'll just do the poll and then we'll come on to hear about how you have been um, using tech within um, care homes. So let me just launch the poll here. Okay, so this, um, just to follow on from what we've been talking about actually, have you bought or are you considering buying a device for an older relative or a loved one? So I think this is really relevant to what we've been talking about today. Um, so often, as Sue has said, it might be that um, you're not buying a device for yourself, but you're actually buying it to make sure that you can maintain that connection with someone else. So I just thought it would be really interesting to see whether people have already bought one or are thinking of buying one. So um, just let this settle in a bit. Okay. I think most people have voted now, so I'm just going to end the poll and share those results. Uh, almost 50-50, but slightly more people have bought or are thinking about um, buying a device for an old relative, so 58% versus 42% there. So thank you very much for taking the time to do that. So over to you, Julie. Definitely over to you now. Um, so tell us about how you've been using technology to help people stay connected. And I know you're in that um, care home setting there. So tell us about it. So um, thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, we've, we realised very early on that the only way that we could keep everybody connected was to embrace the digital medium, whether it was with smartphones or with tablets or laptops, it didn't actually matter. We just needed to keep people connected. And for me, this, this whole period, I think one of the few positives that have come out of COVID, if I can use the positive word in inverted commas, is that it's truly been a digital revolution for more, more of the older generation. You know, young people have embraced it. They've been doing it, you know, they've, they're ending up with opposable, all that kind of stuff. But the, um, it's been fantastic to see how elderly people and older people have actually embraced digital technology. And it's never going to replace a hug from a, a loved one. But it's been lovely, like Sue was saying, for family members to be able to connect and be there when it's the person's birthday or to see newborn babies or just for a chat. Um, it, it's really made a huge difference. So I've kind of like answered two questions in one there. Yeah, but, you have. But the technology, just having access to the technology has made uh, a big difference. And from, we bought, we've bought lots of different ones. We've got, we've got iPads, we've got tablets, we've got Facebook portal devices, and each one has its own sort of quirks. And of course, all of the time that we're using it, because it's in our care homes and the people that are using them might be, frail and unable to use the tablets themselves, they are assisted by the care staff. So we haven't needed to look at something like Comp or like Grandpad, although I think both of them are absolutely brilliant ideas. Um, but it's just, we found it's just been vital, especially for people who have dementia that they can still see their loved ones and still hear their voices. Um, and the difference that that's made has had a huge impact on their mood, not feeling isolated or less isolated, shall we say, because if somebody has dementia, it is a, a, a quite a challenge and they do feel more isolated. 
But I think what it's helped us do is just keep everybody connected and to spread the love and to spread the kindness. Because at the end of the day, it is an extraordinary time that we live in at the moment. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, um, um, you talked a little bit there about the difference that it's making. Um, if we saw like that almost 50-50 split there, if somebody is considering buying a device or unsure, what advice would you offer to people who are caring either informally for a loved one at a distance or, or more formally in a care home setting, given what you've learned around challenges and things? What advice would you give to other people? I think it's got to go back to what Sue said, you know, don't just give them the tab of the iPad and go, there you go, you know, get in touch. I think it's got to be a big tech support behind it. If they decide to get something like the grandpad, for example, they've got that assistance, but you've got to be able to really set it up so that it's ready for use and not just be something where it's, um, you know, they'll figure it out because they won't. You know, it, it's um, we, we all go to what we are used to. And if we're used to speaking on the phone, it's a revelation to be able to see a person on a screen. And it's also a revelation to learn that it's OK to touch a screen because <laughs> the younger, not the, the, the young uns on the call will be thinking oh, touch screen technology. But those of us who are not quite as young will not will know that you were never allowed to touch a screen. And that's quite a barrier to, to get beyond, actually. Um, so the advice that I would offer is whatever you choose to do, make sure that you set it all up in the first place so that all they do have to do is put in, a, 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 go through the simplest possible process uh, to contact you. But I would also say, even when you've done that, be the one who makes the calls. You know, don't necessarily expect them to ring you because they might forget, they might be busy, they might be anxious, they might not know, or the process that they normally go to might fall out of their brains. It happens, you know, it happens to me all the time. And um, so I would say that if, if you are going to do that, you've just got to make sure that it's constantly a, a, that you are making sure that they are able to use that technology. And it's not just a, well, I've shown you once or I've shown you twice or it's got to be that, you know, keep supporting them with it until they get so comfortable that they can start exploring themselves and start looking at things like virtual bucket lists, for example. You know, none of us can travel anywhere. We're doing a project at the moment with all of our different homes where none of us can travel anywhere. But if you've got a virtual bucket list where you've wanted to climb to the top of the Eiffel Tower, there's nothing wrong with um, you help, having someone help you with a VR headset or just a tour to the top of the tower. That's been something that we've discovered that the communication's okay, but oh, let's have a bit of fun. You know, let's have a voyage of discovery. Where are we gonna go? You know, and, and I think that's to, to, once you get beyond the using of the technology, become the, the realization that actually, do you know what? It's really fun. We can go and do fun things together. You know, and I think to explore that side of things is also really, really good. Brings families and, and older people closer together. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and I think, you know, we've looked at that technology, but we've also now heard from yourself and from Sue about, and this is what AbilityNet always says, you know, I'm very passionate about technology and always have been but because of what it can do for people. And that story around a virtual bucket list is just lovely. And I, I just wanted to say that it's also an, another example of where people who have been working inside care homes in these um, crazy times have been going above and beyond um, to look after your residents. So um, thanks to you and all your colleagues for the work that you're doing. Can I say one extra thing that was a, a quite unexpected um, part of this is that we found that the young people, the grandchildren that are 11 or 12 or 20 or whatever, have enjoyed and have embraced it talking to their elderly relatives. Whereas previously it was a chore to go and see Nana and Grandad at the care home. Now it's like, oh, quick, we can dial them up and have a chat. So there's that aspect to it. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just wanted to bring that in because it's, yeah, it's no. really that whole family embracing the technology because everybody starts to understand it or at least develop the ability to use it. 
Thanks so much. No, I think that's an important point. Um, so, Chris, I don't know if you want to um, be on screen now, but Chris has been keeping an eye on the Q&A for me diligently there, and I, I've been watching the numbers. There's been quite a few questions coming through. Chris, are there any trends or anything that in particular that you want to um, raise with our panellists now? Yeah, there's yeah, I think a few, um, which is great. So I think... You know, there, there's a big kind of perception around the cost and the pricing models. Um, and I think if we could perhaps touch on that, people are suggesting doing a comparison chart, which I'm sure we could even look at doing. But um, a question, I think, both to yourself, Jeff, and to George, um, is the, the cost element. So perhaps we come to you first, George, for the comp. Of course, yeah. Um, so we offer either a rental or a purchase option for a comp. Um, so you can rent the comp for £39 a month, um, or uh, you can purchase the comp outright for uh, £599. Um, if you wish to have internet as well, as unlimited internet for £19 a month, uh, that's via the 4G, otherwise it does work on Wi-Fi. Um, and if you're an organization that's looking to use the Comp Pro system, um, those prices for kind of the software uh, range between 10 to 35 pounds a month per device based on, um, yeah, how much of those different features you want to use. So, same for yourself, Jeff. Sure. Um, so, we are, we partnered with a, uh, online store in the UK called Tech Silver. Um, that's where the ground pad is currently available, um, and they specialize in technology for older adults. Um, it's currently available on on a lease model, so it's or a rental model, I suppose you could put it as well. So uh, it's fifty nine ninety nine per month in the UK, or you can get it annually for five hundred and ninety nine. Um, and that is, that includes all the services, the customer support. It also comes with a 4G SIM card as well for internet access. Um, and that is not subject to any sort of contract. So if for whatever reason you no longer, uh, need the device or want the device, you can return it to us and, uh, you're refunded prorated as well. So, um, the idea is, you know, with there's. Obviously, contracts can be concerning for for older people. We didn't want to do that, so that's 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 why that model is in place as well as as well as there's no extra charges. That's all um, that's all inclusive. Great, um, George, um, George from Comp George, and there was a question around whether the same support is in place for Comp. What's the support for Comp? And um, isn't someone to help? Uh, yes, so um, we have. Um, a Customer service team available from nine to five um, on weekdays. Um, you can still contact us outside of those hours, and we'll we'll pick it up uh, the next working day. Um, but yeah, we um, yeah have kind of experienced technical support um, for those. But yeah, not twenty four seven. I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, do you want? Will we take another couple or? Yes, please. Yeah, to, yeah. yeah, fire off as many yeah. as we can get through. Yeah, and Mark McNeil's asking, um, is Grandpad suitable for visually impaired or blind? Will it read back email or use the station software again? Currently, uh, we don't have that functionality. That is uh, one of, of several things we'd love to address in, on our roadmap. So Grandpad has been around for just a over five years now. So um, it's going to grow um, and address uh, more and more issues like that. Um, and we're always testing and, and bringing new features. So unfortunately, currently, we don't have anything to, to address that directly. Um, but it's always it's, it's on the roadmap. Well, great. And George, going to come back to you about accessibility controls for the comp. Does it have any accessibility controls, Richard Carly, is asking? Um, so currently, we don't have any kind of specific other um, accessibility controls. Uh, we've kind of tried to include um, like a very clear screen and large text for the messages to make it um, and a very powerful speaker. Um, but yeah. Uh, we always 
listening to suggestions as we pride ourselves on our customer and user experience. So um, yeah, there's, we, we have had things requesting kind of text to speech and things like that. Um, but yeah, other than that, not at the moment. Um, that answers the question. Great. Thank you. Sue, I'm going to come to you. Um, there's been a couple of questions around um, Empower being in other parts of the UK. And one of the questions actually was it available in France. Uh, but the other question was, is it available in anywhere in North and Scotland? Um, it's been asked. Okay, um, it's not available in France, unfortunately. Um, and as I say, at the moment, there's only the three sites in Scotland. But we're hoping that through the learning of uh, Empower and the way that we deliver our business, um, that will be made um, accessible to other health boards uh, as, things, as things progress. And other health boards are aware of what we're doing. We have spoken to other... Um, uh, health partners uh, about what we're doing. Great, thank you. And the other thing that's been coming up quite a lot is about safety um, on the chat, and it's been a big um, question since um, COVID basically was present. Um, so I'm going to come to you first, George, if that's okay. Um, it's about how the device is managed um, to use internet securely with passwords goes with it. The comp you can't use the internet, but for dialing in, how secure can things be? And the other part of the question is actually the Mac Care project's asking, and can you also make calls out from the comp? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that, um, I'll help to give you a bit more detail on how that works. So, the access um, or the connection between the family members on an app on their phone or tablet. Um, is made by a, um, a single use keyword, which um, basically you enter into the app and that provides the encrypted connection between your device and the comp. Um, that then expires, so it can't be used by anyone else, meaning it can't get into the wrong hands. Um, and then once you're connected in the app, you can then invite other family members from the app. So they'll receive their own code um, which they enter the app to join. Um, so yeah, it's very secure in that sense. Um, the same with the kind of comp pro access, only an administrator on there, which we give initial access to, can invite other staff members to join it. Um, and yeah, in terms of the, the calling, it, it is just a receiving device. We've really tried to reach kind of the, um, the end of the kind of, I guess the bottom end, if you want to say, of, of kind of the technical experience. So to keep it as simple as possible, it is just a receiving device. Um, and those calls are made very easily through the app by family members. Sometimes um, I know people most still have phones. Um, so sometimes we see the elderly relative of the comp calling their family asking for a video call, uh, which is a way of getting around it. But yeah, to keep it simple, the it's just a res receiving device with calls made from the app. Chris, we've only yeah. got um, a few minutes left, but just I think that's a really interesting point. I just wanted to um, ask Julie specifically, actually, um, given that you are caring for, for vulnerable adults, have you had to make any similar considerations around bringing technology into your homes and how have you addressed that? Oh. Uh, if I understand the question, forgive me, I, I'm, I'm not quite getting the, the volume, but we 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 very kept all of our calls are encrypted anyway, so we keep everybody safe. Um, whichever um, we only use in commercially available apps, and we tend to use something like WhatsApp with the Facebook portal device. Um, but we make sure because safety is so important and we need to make sure that everybody's data and, and they themselves are safe. From a point of view of people calling into the homes to speak to their loved ones, um, some, of, some relatives have purchased um, smartphones for their families and so they, they phone in anytime they want to. Um, there's no problem there. With the view of them giving out using the tablet devices, we have a schedule so that everyone has an opportunity to speak to their loved one at least once or twice a week. 
so everybody knows where they're going to, um, you know, when and where they're going to be able to speak to them. Obviously, it very much depends if, for example, the home is, doesn't have um, any um, restrictions from the local health authorities, then we're, in it, we're able to do visiting now, which has made such a huge difference to everybody. But obviously that changes depending on what Public Health England issues and what the government issues from the guidelines. And then we revert to the uh, contacting the person uh, digitally. But also family members who live in places like Canada and Australia and so on, it's great for them because they can schedule all the calls. So everything that we do really is just to make sure that everyone has as much access to one another as possible, as simply and safely as possible. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, and we've got um, a couple of minutes left. So um, I just wanted to um, wrap up a little bit and just some next steps. So as I said at the start, um, we will um, be sending out links after this to the video recording. Um, I can see that we've had a lot of Q and A's um, coming through. Um, so I will look at those in detail afterwards. And I think we'll write a blog post um, answering some of those that we haven't got through to today, Chris, and like say, put the costs up and some links to um, to Comp and to Grandpad up there. So we'll do as much follow up as we can. Um, I just wanted to say um, a massive thank you to everybody who's attended the webinar and also um, to everybody who's been a panelist and to Chris for helping me out. Chris, I think if we've got time for just one final quick question, if you've got one there. I think uh, let's go back to we asked that in the safety question to George. Let's ask it to, to Jeff because it is a prime, you know, issue coming up. So, Jeff, can we come back to you now about how safe is it to use the, the grand pad, in particular with internet browsing? Sure. Yeah, uh, it's it, that was it's obviously one of our most central concerns. Um, so, grand pad was built uh, from the ground up with that in mind. The tablet itself and the software is all proprietary. Um, it is uh, based mm -hmm. on a Android kernel, but the actual operating system and the apps therein are all uh, built by Grandpad. Um, so the device isn't can't be compromised in in a way that a standard device can. Um, the family circle uh, it, again, it's a it's a private uh, family network. Um, we that is accessible via a companion app, either via a computer or a phone, which is uh, password encrypted. We also rope in one of the family members to help with that as well. So we make sure there's a human element. Um, we call them family admins. Um, and these people can uh, admin the uh, secure network of people to make sure that the right people are in that network. And if uh, anybody needs to be added or removed, they can do so. Um, and then finally, all of the content uh, that we have or all of the connections that we make are all on uh, private servers um, with end-to-end -end encryption. So uh, it's not published out there like a traditional social media network would be out in the uh, private, uh, uh, in the public web. So um, lots of steps. I, I probably didn't do it justice in three minutes, but there you go. <laughs> well, thank you. There we go. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And thanks again to everyone for joining. Um, again, to all of our panelists, um, watch out for um, the follow-up survey, for the information um, uh, with all of these devices and with any tablet, AbilityNet um, does offer that um, support and advice as well. Um, and the details of that will be, uh, is within the slides that we shared at the beginning as well. So please do call us and get in touch if you need any support. Um, we work closely with uh, both Comp and with Grandpad as well in terms of providing specific support around that. So um, I'll end the webinar there. Hope everyone's enjoyed it and um, stay safe and uh, keep, hope you all manage to keep in touch with um, your loved ones um, during these challenging times. So thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, bye-bye.